Well, good afternoon and welcome to uh, COMP 422 and COMP 620, uh, Artificial Intelligence and Cybersecurity. I might point out that last August, when I was getting ready for the course, everybody was news, was talking about artificial intelligence. And I thought, oh, I should talk about artificial intelligence and cybersecurity. So I put it on the schedule way near the end of the semester. Well, I wish I knew more about it now than I, <laughs> so I have searched a lot for this topic, but it may not have as much information as I had hoped. A uh, couple things here to note. Oh, we are here uh, today online only. And I noticed in the people participating online that most of the in-class people are here. Uh, glad, thank you for letting me do this online only. And of course, Wednesday this week is Thanksgiving. And so Wednesday, there's no classes, neither uh, Comp 42 and Comp 620 or any a and class. A week from today, we will be reviewing for the exam that is Wednesday next week. Uh, and then we'll have one more class after the exam with material, then a final review on December 6th that will get ready for the final exam, which is Monday, December 11th. Final exam, like the exam on, I can't, like the exam on Wednesday, November 22nd, will be all day. Uh, it will be a start at 6 a.m. in the morning and go to midnight, and it will be online for all students. Now, people always ask me, do you, can you get out of taking the final exam? The answer to that is yes, uh, if it is statistically unlikely that the final exam will change your grade, then you're not required to take it. Why bother? If it's unlikely that it will change your grade, then there seems very little reason for you to take it, very little reason for me to grade it. So I remember several years ago, after I passed out the results of the uh, last exam, a student had something like 99.4 on the ex total class average. He had to get a 23 or something on the final in order to lose his A. Well, it's simply unlikely that he was going to do that. And so why should he have to take the exam? At that time, it was required, but now it is not. Okay, so I will tell you if you are required or not required to take the exam. After the third exam in a week, I will hand back, well, I will email you the results of your uh, course grades, the exam three grades, and the summary of your grades for the semester. And in that email, I will tell you whether you are or are not required to take the final exam. So study hard for the third exam. If you get a good grade, it'll help you. There is an assignment out there this week. The uh, assignment only has three questions. The first one is to send me a convincing phishing email. Please make sure the subject is phishing, just phishing, because I have a filter on my email system that picks up email whose subject is phishing and puts it into a folder so I can then collect all the uh, submissions by the students for this assignment and grade them without getting lost in the rest of my email. So make sure the subject says phishing and nothing else. Uh, the th second question is really simple. Just calculate a value for an integer overflow. We talked about that. And then the third one is to go out to the dark web and go to the CryptBB uh, forum, find the information I posted, and get the code for your, for your user ID and put it in Blackboard. So only two items go in Blackboard. The number that you're going to use for the integer overflow and the uh, answer that you find on the dark web. So, and of course, it's all due next week by, can't lose that, by uh, three o'clock, 3 p.m. in the afternoon. So before class, then before class, be sure you get it out there. Uh, if you have questions during the week about the uh, assignment, just send me an email, send me a, a text message and we'll try to connect on Zoom sometime this week or whenever. 
and work on that together. Okay, so it, it's not that hard. You should never have a problem. Remember, in order to look at the dark website, you have to use the Tor browser. It will not work on Chrome or Edge or other regular browsers. You have to use the TOR Tor browser. Only that will work. And you probably want to copy and paste the link I sent you into the Tor browser and go out and find it. If you go to the chat, or excuse me, the Crypt BB forum, you'll have to create an account and log in. Don't use your real name. You know, this is the black web. Uh, Mr. Jordan, you have a question. Yes. Would you recommend us using Tor in a virtual machine environment? Uh, you don't have to. I think it's safe enough that you can uh, just use it uh, in a regular as a regular browser, I haven't seen any problems. Now, uh, again, be careful. If you're going out there and decide you're going to buy some drugs, uh, yeah, maybe you want to use it in a different environment. But if you don't do anything stupid, it shouldn't be a problem. Going out to the uh, chat or CryptBB uh, forum, I think is pretty safe. Any other questions about the assignment? OK. All right. Oh. If you're going to attack uh, an organization, you have to find them. You have to, first of all, know you want to know some information about them. You want to be able to find out what they have, what servers are out there. Often companies will have a server like www.acme.com is their sales server. That's the one where they expect everybody to go and look at, but they may have many other servers. They may have a server that does their ordering, again, server that does their accounting, maybe multiple servers. Some organizations have a huge number of servers. But there's a, so if you're going to attack them, you may not want to attack the one up front. You may want to look at the other ones. And some of them are probably better protected than others. There are multiple ways that you as a security uh, defender might try to keep the servers uh, protected. One way is by uh, hiding the URLs. Don't let anybody know what the URLs are. Only tell the employees what the URLs Don't make it public. Don't put the URL in any public place so nobody will, nobody will know it. If they don't know the URL, they probably won't go there. Now, this is security through obscurity. You're hoping that nobody will know it. If they learn it, well, then they can get in. And we'll talk shortly about other ways they might find out but that it's there. Another better way is to restrict the access to a particular group. In other words, at A&T, in order to use the banner system, the uh, administrative student records and other information or to use that system, you have to be on campus. It checks the IP address. And if you're not on an on-campus IP address, then you can't connect. That restricts people from off campus trying to get into the administrative system. But it's not foolproof. There are sneaky ways to get around it. A much better way is to have people log in or to all the servers when they access it. So they go to a server, particularly if it's not the front end server, front end one where you have your website or something where you expect all public to be used, that may be free, but all the others require somebody to log in. Of course, remember this uses cookies and some non-cookie identifiers so that when you log in, you use a cookie that says, ah, I know this person and let them know. Of course, you might want to combine the restriction of the IP address to your local network and having them log in to, to reduce unwanted access to your servers. When someone is going to go out and attack a company, it's probably a really good idea to learn as much as you can about their system. You want to know what they have, what they're doing, what kind of security protection they have so that you can have a chance of getting around it. So there's lots of information available out there on, that you can find. 
The easiest thing, of course, is to Google them up, do a web search, find out what you can about them. Sometimes you can Google and do a site specific. In other words, uh, say at a and you can look for something that's in the domain star.ncat.edu, and you'll get all the servers that we have at ANT or all the computers we have at ANT. So that will give you. In social media, companies have a lot of information on social media. News reports, what are, uh, what's the news and other all sorts of magazines, newspapers, what are people saying about this? What does it say about that on the open news? And then corporate records. Uh, companies that are publicly owned are required to uh, provide corporate records, financial records, and that sort of stuff. Uh, so you can get hold of those. They're, they're public. Get those. You can look and see how the company's doing. What kind of money do they have? What are they doing with the money? What issues do they have? So all sorts of things are required to uh, publish, and you might want to get those. You can also look at state, city, and uh, records. Oh, what property do they own? Where is it? And that sort of stuff. To make it all easy, you can. This can be uh, automated. You can have systems to go out there and switch. Well, of course, in some sense, Google is an automated system. But you can, if you're going to do this more than once, you can have a system that goes out there and looks for the sort of public information, so that you can get information on a potential attack. And of course, remember that people are doing this against your company. You want to look at the servers, and as you found a company, you want to see what kind of computers they have out there. There are several ways you can do that. When you go out to the server, if you look at Chrome Debugger, it, you look at the network traffic, it tells you what servers it's connecting to. So you'll find out not only is it going to one server, but maybe it'll be going to other servers for other information. Or you can just look in the HTML page and look at all the uh, links and see what links that may not all go to the same server. They may go to a collection of servers. As I mentioned, if you use Google, you can look at the site-specific or domain-specific information. And of course, phishing is always a weak point in any organization. You can send emails out and ask the people for the information you want. You know, somebody's likely to give it to you. Uh, remember that there's a phishing assignment coming up due next month. You got to send me a fish. You can, by the way, pretend you're anybody, but it has to be convincing. There are several tools out there that you can use to find out information about networks. Nmap is one. Nmap, uh, it's one of those free open source utilities, network discovery. You can run it and it will send out packets to all the IP addresses on a particular subnet that you specify. So you can identify a network and it will go out and look for all the computers on that network. It sends records and measures and tells you what they're doing. Again, you can run it on an individual computer or you can run it on a whole network. Here's the output you might get from Nmap. You can see here it's scanning one individual machine. In this case, there is the IP address of the machine. It was, this is by the way, scanme.nmap.org. This is their example computer that they say, well, go ahead and scan this one. It's safe. We expect you to do that. Uh, some companies don't like you to scan their systems. Uh, and it shows that there are 995 closed ports, meaning these ports did not respond, but some of them did. Uh, port 22, which is uh, open SSH, that's a, a shell, secure shell, that's open. Uh, port 80, that's the websites. And there are others that are open here that you might be able to access that. And ping, there's a NPing. It's a special NPing, special type of ping system that is open there. And of course, it tells you what operating system it's running and that sort of stuff. So you can find that tells you. Now, this one was only aimed at one particular address. You could go star.nmap.org and it will go out and look for everything that's an nmap.org computer and tell you about all of them. Another tool, if you want to get down and look at the network, is Wireshark. Wireshark uh, looks at the very low level. It looks at packets that go back and forth. Uh, we've used 
up. Uh, we've used a proxy that shows you the HTTP packets that go back and forth. Wireshark's a little bit lower level than that. It shows you everything going out there. Wire, uh, the proxies that we've used only show the HTTP, but Wireshark shows you everything, which may be more than you want to see, but you can see all the details where everything is going, what servers are involved, what IP addresses are used. Snort is a open source intrusion prevention and analysis system. It goes out there, you can run Snort, and it will tell you all about the traffic that's going on, who's sending packets where, uh, what they contain, what kind of packets are going back. You can also get alerts. It's good for intrusion prevention. You can say, tell me if this sort of stuff is going on. Uh, and again, it's open, it's an open, well, it's free, but there's also a purchase version, kind of like uh, Linux. You can get Linux free or you can buy it. If you buy it, of course, you get support and help. Wi-Fi, you can go out and monitor the Wi-Fi and see what traffic is going out there. Uh, attackers do this. Imagine you're sitting in Starbucks, your favorite coffee shop, and somebody there has got a system that's monitoring all the Wi-Fi traffic. You only need to use a laptop to do this. And they can look at all the traffic going on in there and see what you're you're doing. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes, so they just need to set up their own, own Wi-Fi hotspot. Uh, they can do what's called an evil twin attack. That is, they can create a hotspot. Again, they only need to have a Wi-Fi to do this. Create a Wi-Fi hotspot. Uh, say they're sitting in a Starbucks or wherever, and they create one. They might even use the same SSID, that's the network ID that Starbucks, that location is using. And so if you come in there, you might connect or you see, and of course, I'm going to call it Starbucks or something. It's the same or similar name. So you sit down, log in, connect to that one, particularly if they happen to be closer to you than wherever the official router is, then you might connect to them. The danger of that, of course, is while they can make it look just like a real legitimate thing, that most traffic will go through, but they can record it, monitor it, uh, falsify it. If you're going to a website that they prepare to fake, they might <clears throat> send you to a false website. They might have a fake Amazon or something they send you to. And then, and also, of course, they can look at all, well, you go to a fake Amazon and you actually connect there. They can see what you're sending. Okay, our first clicker question for today. I can get my mouse to behave. Uh, there it is. All right. And okay, there we are. Hopefully, you can. Okay, hopefully, the polls are up there for all of you. Okay, still a couple of you that have an answer. Wants somebody else an answer out there. All right, well, let it go with that. There's results as you see, everybody picked all the above. That'd be really nice if that was the right answer, but it's not. Uh, the correct answer is A. Now, I know if you go to, a lot of websites will tell you, oh, if you go to run encrypted public Wi-Fi, they can see everything. That's not necessarily true. You should know as security people now, you, we've talked a lot again most of the semester, Amazon uses HTTPS. It uses a secure connection. So yes, the lower levels of the Wi-Fi is not encrypted. If you have a Wi-Fi site that has WP or one of the multiple encryption systems, they will encrypt it at a low level. If you don't, then you can still encrypt it with HTTPS. If you do HTTPS, they can see uh, that you visited Amazon because HTTPS will 
connect up. HTTPS encrypts all the data being sent over the Wi-Fi. Of course, the data includes the connection information, all the stuff that's displayed on your screen, all the stuff that you entered. But be able to see that you're going to Amazon because that's in the headers. That's in the HTTP the, or the, the internet protocol headers will include the site you're going to. So they'll know you're going to Amazon. They know that thing is coming back to your computer from Amazon, but they can't see what it is. They can't change it because it's encrypted. If they change it, then the uh, checksum will not work and it'll be detected as a bad message to retransmit. So no, the answer to this is A, spite all the hysteria that you might see on websites, no. If it's unencrypted and you're using HTTPS, they can see where the packets are going, but they cannot see what's in them. They cannot change it. Hey, got to pay attention in class. Okay. Intrusion detection systems. I mentioned this briefly um, in an earlier lecture. Intrusion detection is a software or it can be a device that monitors the networks and looks for malicious activity or something that's not what it's supposed to be. It's either something that it thinks is uh, malicious or a policy violation, maybe rules about what you can and can't do and is looking for violations of that. So they sit out there and they watch all the traffic going back and forth in all directions. There also, by the way, it can be host-based uh, intrusion detection systems that have nothing to do with your network. They're looking at the computer and watching what is done, what files do you access, what steps are you taking? And they are looking for unusual activity, doing something that they expect you should not do. Some systems try to respond. If they find something that they feel is inappropriate, they will send an alert to a system administrator who is supposed to respond in some way to the problem. But IDS is a little bit different from a firewall. Firewalls are built at the gateway, the point where the network connects to the internet and it filters what goes through that. So only that information that you're going to allow according to the rules of the firewall are allowed to come into your network. An intrusion detection system looks at all the traffic and looks for something that's malicious. So if one computer on your internal network is doing something inappropriate with another computer on your network, then the IDS will detect that, whereas the firewall won't because it's not going in or out of the of your network. You might note that a firewall is a bit more proactive than an ID. IDS detects that something malicious is happening. And it may be able to uh, alert somebody or even make automatic decisions to try to slow something down, but it doesn't really slow it down as much as a firewall stops it before it happens. On the other hand, uh, firewalls have their limitations, IDSs have their limitations. Using both is a really good idea. Now, there are a couple ways an IDS can work. There are signature-based IDS that, similar to a antivirus system, looks for specific patterns of action that they know are malicious. If you're doing something, you go, oh, that's not. Anomaly-based uh, systems look for activity that is statistically different from the normal network activity. In other words, you have your IDS watch the system for a while, as long as everything's happy and working correctly, and tries to see what it looks like. And then when you're running it later, if it finds something that's not like the normal network traffic it saw, it might flag it as being uh, possibly ma malicious. They do produce false positives. That is, they may say, this doesn't look good. When in fact, it's somebody doing regular work it's just a little bit different than their normal regular work. Of course, there are false negatives where they don't detect things. Well, another question to keep you busy. Oh, hang on. There's, oh, where is that? All right, there we go. Sorry, sometimes 
Zoom doesn't like the way I press the buttons. Anybody else uh, want to answer? Okay, let's take a look at the answers. All right, people are pretty sure that all the above and SNRT were not the answer. Uh, Nmap is probably your best tool. Wireshark looks at what's going across the network in great detail, but Nmap, the tool is designed to go find out what is on the given. It maps a network, the network mapping tool. You can point it at a, a subnet or a network, and it will tell you all the computers that are on that, what uh, services they provide, what ports are open, what ports are not open, and it allows you to know exactly what's out of the network. Now, it can be stopped by a uh, firewall or a network address translation system that may stop uh, and map from going in. But uh, without those, you know, it may be able to look at all the stuff on the network. Okay. All right, I want to talk a little bit about a advanced persistent threat. I don't know if I've mentioned this this semester, but advanced persistent, uh, advanced persistent threats are the worst kind of attacks. They are an attack to that gains unauthorized access to your computer network and then remains there. They typically load some sort of malware and stay in the background. These are often run by state-sponsored groups. In other words, some country or uh, organization, non-state actor, uh, terrorist group, may decide they want to do something and so they uh, get a group, they, they hire the best professionals they can find and go out to get you. They use some tools to gain author, unauthorized access. They use whatever sort of tool available to get there. They try all the things that they know, things we talked about in class. Once they get in, then they'll load some software, uh, usually install some sort of custom malware that sits there and it looks around quietly, checking the environment. Are there other computers on this network? Kind of like Nmap, it goes out, anybody else out here? Anybody else we might infect? So it infects those. And then it waits. The systems, the information I was looking at talks about a dwell time, the time between when the advanced persistent threat loaded some custom malware, uh, and when do they find it? It varies for different regions, interestingly enough. Uh, in the Americas, that would be the North America and South America, we're pretty good at finding it in 71 days. Although 71 days, that's 10 weeks. Um, Asia, folks in Asia, it took them over half a year to figure it out. So it sits there and waits. The advanced business, APT, advanced, and then it uses all sorts of uh, tools. Full spectrum of intelligent gathering. They, as we talked about before, looking for open source intelligence, they will do those things. <coughs> Excuse me. They will find out about the networks that you have. They will use a variety of tools to get in and load their software there. Uh, and once they're there, they may wait until the time is for them to do something, try to get as many systems many of your systems infected as they can. Typically, of course, they have a specific objective. These are, again, countries or terrorist organizations that are out to attack. So they're usually well-funded, motivated, and organized. Here is the uh, advanced persistent threat life cycle, picture I got from Wikipedia. First thing they want to do is figure out who you are, find a target. Where they find out as much about the target as they can, uh, 
do again all sorts of intelligence gathering. Try to get in, find a way in, find some way where you can get at least one of the computers. From there, spread the uh, information around. Uh, use the compromised system to access the networks of others. You can also, of course, do this through uh, intermediate computers. Otherwise, if you are the bad guys, you might not do this directly from your computer. You might infect oh, some neutral party and have their computer attack your the computer of the victim that you have. Using a wide variety of tools that you can do this. And then the last step is try to cover up what you've done. Go out and change the log files so that indication of your access is not there anymore. Okay. Today's lecture is artificial intelligence and cybersecurity, so I suppose you ought to get around to artificial intelligence. Although the other things are pertinent because all of them relate to artificial intelligence in a way. Oh, okay, artificial, what is this artificial intelligence? The basic concept of artificial intelligence is trying to make the computer do something that people think is intelligent. They can look like it's something a human being would do. I can tell you, since I'm a old gray computer guy who's been programming for 50 years. The AI folks have been out there for decades. Uh, and for decades they've been telling us, oh, they're going to do this and they're going to be able to do that. And it's interesting enough, after 40 years or so, they're finally being able to do it. Oh, they told us 40 years ago they're going to have self-driving cars. And lo and behold, we've almost got self, well, we have self-driving cars, although um, they're not safe right now, we should hope. An interesting question I have is where does artificial intelligence start and when does that go beyond the regular old computer programs that we've been using for years? Because if you write a computer program, well, it's probably doing something that's much more difficult for you to do by than for you to do by hand. A calculator can calculate the square root of a number much faster, much better than I can do it in my head or with a pencil on paper. Is that artificial intelligence? Oh, I don't think so. But where where is artificial intelligence? What is you know, where is the computer? People keep talking about oh, that's using artificial intelligence. Well, is that artificial intelligence or is it just a good computer program? I'm not really sure where that line is. So when people start saying we ought to we ought to uh, monitor and control and have laws that regulate artificial intelligence, first thing you're going to have to do is figure out what it is. Artificial intelligence happens to be very useful. Uh, the search engines, Bing, Google, all use artificial. There's an option now if you go to Google or to Bing and say, turn on the AI feature. And it will not only look out there and search for things, but it summarizes it and gives you a summary of the information that it found. So it's using artificial intelligence. Um, all sorts of recommendation systems you want to uh, if you go to Amazon, you're thinking of something, it will go out and try to figure out by looking at what you've done before, what sort of widget did you want to buy? Because they want to sell you a widget and they go out there and looking for what you want. And of course, media companies, YouTube, Netflix, others uh, want to show you things that they think you'll be interested in without trying to show you things that they figure you won't be interested in. And that's artificial. Uh, we have human speech systems, uh, Siri, Alexa, you can talk to these boxes and they will respond. Of course, human human rec, ah, human speech recognition is difficult. One of the challenges for many years, we find that things like human speech recognition take measurable amount of computer resources. It's not something that you could do with your old computers. I started my first computer I had was an old IBM PC with an 8086 chip. Uh, running at a great big uh, 4.77 megahertz. That's megahertz, not gigahertz. 4.77 megahertz. They couldn't do speech recognition. It just didn't have the power. Well, it might be able to do speech recognition if you wanted to give it an hour to figure out a sentence, but couldn't do it in real time. But now we've got faster computers, faster chips. We can do this sort of stuff in real time. There's a really good example of artificial intelligence or self-driving cars. They're out there, they're driving around. My car is not a self-driving car, but I have adaptive speed uh, cruise control. It keeps it in the lane. So I'm driving along as I, it will 
drive itself more or less. It will, if I start to go towards the edge of the lane, it moves me automatically back to the middle of the lane. Uh, if I come up behind another car, it will slow down. I have to brag, I did buy a new car uh, a month or two ago. It's an all electric car and it's so cool, but it is, does have all these features. I think it's cool because my, I usually drive cars until they die. And so my last car was about a dozen years old. And they've done an awful lot of things to cars in the last 12 years. I'm amazed. So and other things, we all know chat GPT uh, and there's other AI art uh, tools out there that can draw really neat pictures for you. And of course, game play. They can play games at a very high level. They can beat the best players these days. The part of artificial intelligence that most people are talking about these days is machine learning. Machine learning looks at a whole bunch of information and tries to recognize statistical patterns in it and then generalize that and be able to make decisions based on these patterns. Uh, data mining, which is looking through a whole bunch of data and finding patterns is very simple, excuse me, it's very, it's very much related to machine learning. And then there's deep learning. I can tell you the truth, I couldn't really figure out what deep learning was, except that it uses multiple layers of machine learning. These often use neural networks and other machine learning tools. So they go out there. And these are what people are mostly talking about. There's more to AI than machine learning. Although when you hear in the news and people are talking about AI, they're really talking about machine learning applications. That subset of AI that is machine learning. They generally don't talk about areas in artificial intelligence that are not machine learning. Nobody seems to be concerned about them. Uh, there's much more. Uh, years past, here at A&T, I uh, taught along with another instructor a uh, course in game programming. Now, the other instructor taught the cool stuff. They created games that had big uh, graphics and fast moving. I, on the other hand, taught the dull stuff. What we refer to as alternating player games with no hidden information. But that's like chess and checkers and Kayla. Those are the games where I move, then you move and I move. And there's no hidden, we can see all about it. The computers can get be really good about this, but they don't use machine learning. They uh, typically look ahead. The games I have, well, some of them use machine learning, but the ones I played, the ones I taught, uh, just use the computer power to look ahead. There's so many ways I can move. And from that, there's so many ways that you can move. And then from that, there's so many ways that I can move in response to that. You can think of it as a large tree that fans out based on how many moves. So for every possible move I can make, it looks at every possible move you can make for each one of those moves. And then goes back and looks at all the possible moves I can make in response to all yours and keeps going for multiple layers. That, of course, gets to be a really large tree very fast. If there are... Uh, D possible moves for everyone, then it's uh, D to the N possible outcomes. That becomes very large as you go to N. Well, so you go with it like four or five times, it's a large number. Alphabet pruning is an algorithm to reduce the size of the tree that will look at the tree and it said, no, you don't have to look at all of them. In fact, it reduces it to be D to the N divided by two, which is a really big, I mean, just, just looks what the exponent is divided by two. Well, if you do the arithmetic, that turns out to be a very large uh, reduction. And I have to mention that alphabet pruning was invented by Dr. James, James Slagle, uh, who was at the University of Minnesota. He was there when I was there and we were working on a checkers program in an effort to beat the world's best checkers player, who at that time was a human being. And, uh, he said, well, why don't we do this? You might try this algorithm. And I went out to the library and looked up that, and looked up by famous uh, computer scientists, wrote articles about it. And at the end of the article, it says, oh, and we need to recognize the uh, Dr. James Slagle for his contributions to this field. I go, him, I know him, he's right here. Uh, I also might point out, he was interesting. He was blind, uh, couldn't see, had, a, had his dog named Ranger that kept, took him around but he was brilliant. He's like, want to stand next to this guy because he just radiates brilliance. Okay, let me give you an example about AI. There's a really simple game called NIM. 
Imagine you have a pile of stones and two players alternately pull out a stone. I take one, two or three stones, and you can take one, two or three stones, and I take one, two or three stones. The goal is to make your opponent take the last stone. Now, if you sit around and think about it for a while, you can probably come up with a pretty good strategy on how to win. But there's another way to do it. Uh, you can write a program that figures it out. Uh, I had my freshman programming class write this program. So let me just explain the program right now. Uh, there are three possible moves, one, two, or three stones. So you have an array that's three by however many stones you might have. What's the maximum number of stones you might allow? So it's that maximum number by three. And each index is how many stones you have. And there's three values, one, two, or three. And there are numbers that are used to weight the decision. There's integer numbers. A bigger number in that position means that you're likely to pick that one. So let's just say you initialize all the numbers to a thousand. And you have the, in the first one that says, I want to pick stone one, it might have the value 500. In position two, it might have the value of 500. But in position three by that number, it might have the value 2,000, meaning it's much more likely that you should pick that number because that's the biggest one. Uh, program starts by playing itself. Oh, a whole bunch of them. Eh, a million games or so. Does matter. Just a lot. A whole bunch of them. If a million doesn't get it really good, use two, 10 million. Doesn't matter. So you play it by itself. And initially, it's just guessing because initially you set all these values to the same way. So it has equal probability it'll pick one, two, or three. But every time it picks one, it keeps track of what numbers it picked for each position. And then if it wins that game, it goes, oh, I won. Those must be good moves. So it goes back and increases the value of the one that moves and decreases the ones that didn't win. And you play a million times, and after that, typically the values for the numbers that win become very large and the values that don't win become very small. I usually floored them out at one, uh, one instead of zero because it turns out the program didn't like zeros. So after, after some training, so you, you better play for a million times and then it played against the human. By that time, it knew the good guesses. I was one cup. When it got to a number of, of stones, it would then look at the three, randomly choose weighted based on those numbers and pick the one. And of course, if it had learned that say number three was a good choice at the time, it would pick number three. So another clicker question to see if you understand what's going on. Okay, a couple more people want to put their guess out there, click what they know is the right answer. Oh, okay. Let's uh, end the poll, show you the results. As you can see, uh, there was at least one person voted for everyone, but most people thought machine learning. Machine learning is the right answer. It is a machine learning application. Uh, yes. In other words, you didn't tell it how to play. The programmer wrote an algorithm that made it learn how to play. It played itself a million or so times and learned a good strategy. The programmer did not program a winning strategy. The programmer programmed the program, wrote the program to learn how to determine a winning strategy. So after it's played itself a couple million times and you play against them, it's usually very good. But at that point, even the programmer doesn't know exactly how it's going to play. It doesn't know what the good strategy is. It just knows that the program it wrote figured it out. That's an important concept because when people talk about artificial intelligence, they know that they 
not always sure if the program is making decisions. And yes, often people who use artificial intelligence, machine learning applications, don't know what the computer has learned. They don't know exactly how it's making the decision or why it is choosing a particular option. Same as the game of NIM. We already understand the game of NIM. It was a simple idea. And again, freshmen could write that program and it was a machine learning application. Now, if you look at anything on the news, on the web, uh, listen to uh, all sorts of people, they'll tell you that AI is extremely dangerous. Well, why is it dangerous? What makes it dangerous and is it dangerous? First of all, it's unlikely that the computers are gonna think they would be better without humans. That of course is the big risk that you see in all the movies that the computers take over and decide these humans are just annoying and they can do better without them. Uh, that I believe is extremely unlikely, at least, at least in my lifetime, maybe even in your lifetime, which should hopefully be a lot longer than my lifetime. Um, but doesn't mean that AI is not, doesn't have its dangers or its problems. The real danger of AI is when we start to assume that its decision-making uh, skills are better than humans. Now, in many cases, of course, it is, but it's not foolproof. We can write systems that go through all the data about who should get a bank loan and look at all the people that gave bank loans to and who uh, paid them back and stuff. And it might be able to make pretty good decisions, but it might make very biased decisions. It might decide, oh, people in these neighborhoods uh, haven't been able to pay back. And for many uh, political economic reasons, it may be racist, it, you know, it, it doesn't give loans. So it may not be make good decisions. It may make decisions that are uh, based on the other, but it may not make as good a decision as a human. All of these things need to be monitored by human beings. There are all sorts of things where AI could be dangerous. Autonomous weapons seem to me to be the worst one. Right now we have drones flying in other countries uh, that send missiles down to blow up people and kill people. I had a friend who uh, <clears throat> drove a drone. Uh, he was here in the United States, I think he was in Arizona. He drove a drone that flew around, uh, I think it was in Iraq, during the Iraq war. Uh, and then occasionally they would uh, bomb somebody. It was interesting, he said he flew the drone, but there was a whole committee, you know, a half dozen people there to decide that they're going to do something. They're going to fire the weapons of the drone at somebody. It wasn't just him making this decision. There were all sorts of people. There were CIA people there who had to determine that, yes, they're pretty sure that the person or the uh, target is in fact a dangerous uh, terrorist and somebody or an enemy, somebody that they should shoot the weapon at, not some people out on a Sunday picnic. Uh, <clears throat> so that was a danger for autonomous weapons. You don't, you know, again, they had a whole group of people making that decision. Well, that put some humans in there. You don't want just a program making that, de that decision when the outcome means let's kill this person. Uh, there's other dangers of AI, social manipulation. People are gonna use AI to try to sway public opinion. And of course, as I mentioned, uh, discrimination, if you don't uh, look carefully at how the computer is making decisions, it may be uh, discrimination. You can imagine somehow you're gonna to try, to, to try to be able to recognize a criminal just by looking at them. So they train that machine learning system against all sorts of people. They show pictures of all sorts of criminals in jail and they show pictures of people out on the street. And then they show up other pictures. Well, of course, all the criminals might be wearing bright orange jumpsuits. I'll tell you, no matter who you are, President of the United States, if you're wearing a bright orange jumpsuit, the AI system is gonna say, that's him, they're a criminal. Uh, invasion of privacy, you can look at all sorts of open source intelligence and gain an awful lot of information about the person. And sometimes you can start to analyze and merge different data sources and find out information that you probably don't want released. And of course, for hundreds of years, artificial intelligence or computers have been uh, taking people out of jobs. They've been replacing people. Their job has been automated uh, ever since uh, the Jacquard started making looms 
that were automated instead of having weavers do it. And that was in the late 1700s sometime. So it's been around for a long time. With AI, of course, the art, the job displacement is moving up the chain. At one point, you had uh, computers or just machines replacing people. If you're out digging ditches a couple hundred years ago, your job can be replaced by uh, steam engines or uh, steam shovels, big diesel uh, devices that dig up holes. They, uh, they can dig up faster than 100 guys. Well, now, of course, they're replacing people who do white collar jobs with artificial intelligence. Uh, an in uh, IDS, an intrusion detection system, is much better at identifying abnormal malicious traffic if it uses artificial intelligence or machine learning. Machine learning. They go out there to watch the normal traffic and that's their training data. And then if something is out of the normal, something's coming in, there is traffic that's not normal, then they might say, aha, something. So imagine you have your normal track and then somewhere someone is gonna use the Nmap tool to look at your network. All of a sudden they see somebody going through all the addresses in your network in numerical order. They're looking for all these networks. And if you're doing a map, they're going to go through all the possible computers that can be there. And of course, many of them will not be there. So you see all this traffic going to computers that don't exist. Some of them go to computers that do exist. And you go, that's not usual. Yes. And of course, an artificial intelligence system may recognize this. Of course, you can still get around this. Sometimes it's possible to have an attack come in that looks like everyday traffic, but it's not. Another use of artificial intelligence is deep fakes. That's where they can manipulate images, either audio or pictures, uh, videos, or just audio, so it looks like somebody else. Deep fakes are out there making it look like one other person. So they're using all sorts of machine learning and artificial intelligence to create videos that are not real. And it's been going on now. There was a video of the President Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, calling the Ukrainians to surrender. Well, he never did that, but the Russians made one, and broadcast it out to Ukraine, trying to fake them out. There was an interesting one that's not really malicious. There was one in India where a candidate wanted to speak to people with a different language. He didn't speak a particular language. India has many different languages that they use. And so they got a deep fake that used him, but it put somebody else's speech in there in order to translate his speech into a different language so the people of that language could see the video and believe that it's him. A big thing has been in the news lately is actors being in scenes that they weren't in, using actors to, uh, using the depiction of actors and then using artificial intelligence to map their image into an artificially intelligent scene. So if you do the movie and then you just said, oh, I need another scene in here, or this one didn't quite look the way it is, we have to redo it. Well, instead of bringing the actor back and paying him when he comes back or her, then you can just create an artificial intelligence. Of course, movies are all generated with all sorts of computer generated images. You can generate a computer generated image and you put the actor's likeness in it. Actors didn't like that because they don't get paid for that. And as you, they have the I guess, intellectual property, whatever you want to call it, of their image. And now the movie producers have to pay the actors if they use their image in a computer generated image. Uh, and looking around the uh, network, I saw a report that said 96% of all fake, deep fakes online were pornographic. And not only were they pornographic, there's apparently a market for mapping the faces of well-known people into pornographic images. And you can bet deep fakes are coming. In the United States, in about 11 more months, we'll be deep into a presidential election. Not only presidents, but senators, well, about a third of the senators, uh, all the congressmen, all sorts of local state positions are going to be up for re-election. 
There's going to be a lot of people out there. Deep fakes are possible now. They're much easier than they were four years ago or eight years ago. And so a lot of politicians and political groups are going to use them because they can. They now have that ability. It's relatively cheap to create these deep fakes, and so they will. This is, of course, a Ken Williams opinion or a prediction, but I'll tell you, you're going to see deep fakes where they'll slander the other, they'll slander their opponent. In other words, they'll have advertisements that they'll say is for candidate A, and candidate A will say some terrible things that nobody would vote for a candidate who said those things, but it won't be candidate. Candidate will never have said those things. Deep fakes have an impact on cybersecurity. You can use deep fakes to pretend you're somebody else in a very convincing way. And they can use deep fakes to convince you that you should do something. If this is, uh, oh, Chancellor Martin. Chancellor Martin says, everybody, we should do this. And of course, it's Chancellor Martin. People say, well, yeah, he says we should do that. We should do that. But it won't be Chancellor Martin. It'll be somebody else faking, pretending they're Chancellor Martin, a computer-generated image of Chancellor Martin or whoever it is. So they can use that. They're big on social media uh, and highly personalized phishing emails. So on social media, you can see a lot of generated uh, deep fakes because they are present on social media sites. Okay, so we've seen deep fakes and other machine learning has been out there already. Uh, hackers are using it. More and more of the hackers are saying, oh, I can use artificial intelligence tools to do advanced persistent threats and other attacks. And so if you're gonna defend your system, you better be at least as good as the attackers. So if the attackers are using all the artificial intelligence tools at their disposal, uh, you better start using some advanced techniques to defend yourself against them. So that's what I have to say about artificial intelligence. Uh, might mention next week, Wednesday, Nine days from now is the third exam. I will be sending out more information on what you can expect, but here's a list of topics we have covered in alphabetical order, not in any other particular order. And here is the sections or chapters of the textbook that talk about that. We talked today about artificial intelligence impact, which is not at all in the textbook. I wish it was. Uh, buffer overflow, talked about that in detail. Uh, that's in section 13.5. Computer forensics, we talked about that. Uh, the dark web, there's a dark web assignment out there. You better know something about the dark web and what makes it different. Why is the dark web different than the rest of it? Uh, denial of service, uh, electronic voting, malware, general privacy issues. And we talked for a couple of days about secure software development. So those are the topics that you'll find uh, on the next exam. I'll be more explicit a week from today when I go over in detail about things that will be out there. And I'll try to get the, the uh, slides out there soon. Okay. Uh, again, there is an assignment out on Blackboard. Only three questions. Uh, phishing. That you have to send me an email. Send me an email that uh, looks realistic that he said, oh, I want to do it. I'll click on a link. And while the link will say, I'll go to someplace, it will send me to the comp 422, comp 620.online class website. That's a safe website. Well, sort of safe. We've done a lot of nasty things on it, but it sends me there instead of where, it's, where I think it will send me. Make sure the subject is phishing because my email system is going to pick up subjects that are phishing and put them in a particular folder so they don't get lost in the rest of my email. And so when I go to grade this thing, I can go down my phishing folder and find your email. There's a integer overflow. And then there's an assignment where you have to go out to the dark web. I looked at the Crypt BB forum. By the way, that's Crypt Bulletin Board. And find the information that I posted. You'll have a number that you compute by taking the last four digits of your social security, not your security, not your social security, of your university ID, your banner ID, test the last four digits, uh, mod 418, it gives you a number. And then look up that number in my uh, information. And then the thing I posted on CryptBB, and there's a word next to it. Put that word in the blackboard, and that is your 
That's right. Um, Mr. Williams, uh, did you have something? Yeah. Yes, sir. So for the subject line for fishing, do we put fishing and then our name? No, just put name? fishing. Oh, someplace. Okay. If you use your ANT email address, send it to me. I don't know who it is. If you don't do that, somewhere like, you know, put a bunch of blank lines at the end, put your name so I know who sent it to me. I have, yes, I do need to know who it came from. If it's just from your email, uh, I'll know who we, I know your email, if your university email. Otherwise, put your name in it somewhere, not in the beginning where I, where I can look at it and go, oh, the Third National Bank wants me to sign in here. Put it someplace where I can find out who it is. Um, now, if you have problems with any of the assignments during the week, this is Thanksgiving week, just email me, send me a text message, and we can try to connect together on Zoom this week. Uh, my schedule is not real busy. I'm on vacation. But I can always pop on Zoom and help you out with this. Okay. Uh, this is the schedule coming up. Again, we just talked about AI impact. Uh, no class on Wednesday in two days. The next exam is in nine days. Wednesday next week, we will review for it in a week. Uh, then there's one more class with actually material. Someday after this third exam, before class period on Monday, uh, the TAs and I will grade the exam and we'll I'll email you a summary of your exam like I did last time. And it will tell you whether you are or are not exempt from the final exam. The third exam will be in the format of the previous ones, online, available from 6 a.m. to midnight on Blackboard. And again, the final exam, just like I said, same format as all the other exams. Uh, if when I send back your results of the third exam, and I've calculated how you're doing for the whole semester, if you've done well, or if it's statistically unlikely, not necessarily well, but if you're in the middle of the C range, let's say you, you're scored right in the middle of the range of Cs, and 100 isn't going to move you out of the C, and a 20 isn't going to move you below the C, then why bother? I don't think you want to take the final. I don't want to bother the TAs and I do not want to grade it. So if it's not going to change your grade, then why bother? Uh, anytime though, if you are exempt from taking the final exam, that is, it is optional. Remember, it's optional. You're still allowed to take it if you wish. Sometimes I'll say, oh, it seems unlikely that you won't get a 95 or better to change your grade, but you can try. You're always welcome to give it a try. Note, by the way, if you do try, you do really, really miserable, it could drop your grade. But in general, people who try, very, very rarely do they screw up so bad that their grade drops. They may possibly improve their grade. That's it. Any questions about any of the exams or the schedule or any of the material, the assignments? We're a little early. That's it for today. I will be back in class. Uh, I'll be back in person, in class, online, on YouTube uh, next week, Monday. And if you have questions, send me a note and we'll figure it out. That's it for today. Bye.